Hey everybody, today we're going to take a look at my favourite Permajet papers and why I like to use them. So here we go. Okay, whenever I'm lecturing or giving workshops or anywhere where I'm talking to other photographers, one of the biggest questions I get is, what papers do I use? And the follow-on question is always, why do I use those papers? So I figured that a really good idea would be to make a short video and take you through my favorite papers and why I like them. So to start, um, the Permajet paper range falls into a few different categories, okay? So what we're going to go through is we'll go through one or two papers from each one. Um, and at another point, we might go, you know, through more in-depth information and in-depth detail about some of the papers. I might even do a specific video on each paper at some point, uh, time allowing. But for now, we'll just give a quick brief overview of the ones that I like. The ranges that we're going to look at are the digital photo range the fine art range and there's fine art smooth and fine art textured and also the fiber based papers okay so there are other categories of papers that you can get from permajet as well like they've got a double sided range they've got various other media but we're going to focus on those ones for today because that's the stuff that I tend to use for the vast majority of my printing so let's start with something from the digital photo range now, the way the ranges work, kind of the way we're order, the order we're going to take them, the way we're going to go through them is kind of in ascending order of, I guess, price and, you know, standard of paper, okay? That's not to say any of them are of a low standard, but obviously there are different tiers of quality depending on what you need. Now, the digital photo range contains a lot of the general purpose papers, um, a lot of papers that are really good for everyday printing in a a lot of different finishes and surfaces so it's really good to be aware of what's in there because you don't always want to print for example on you know your favorite baryta paper if you're just printing for everyday printing or for proofing or you know testing out new images or whatever so it's a good idea to become familiar with some of the the digital photo range the first one that i'm going to quickly talk about is oyster now, in this video, it's going to be difficult for you to feel what I can feel or to see what I can see on the paper surfaces or to get an idea of the experience I get when an image comes off the printer in, you know, any of the paper types. But that's kind of the whole point is to give you an idea of my experience with the papers and what kind of a finish and, you know, what kind of a final touch it can give to the images and where it works best. Okay. So at some point we might see if it's possible for us to be able to, on, on a more in-depth video, photograph some of the surfaces and see if that would be useful. But for now, this is really about my experience. And of course, some of this is going to be my opinion, okay? Now this is Oyster. Oyster is a really, really cool general purpose paper. It's quite white, um, which means it can be quite vibrant and give a good pop. You know, the first thing you notice about it is that you can get really clear whites on, on the paper when you print on it for the first time. When I did my associateship and fellowship distinctions for both the Irish Photographic Federation and for the Royal Photographic Society many years back, I printed them all on Oyster, okay? So even though it falls into the digital photo range, like I said, that doesn't say it can't produce incredible quality prints. Absolutely it can, and sometimes it's the right paper for even, you know, the most critical of printing. Now, the reason I printed my panels on it is because it can, you know, accentuate the whites a little bit. And a lot of my images were quite dark. So anywhere where I had detail that needed to be, you know, I needed to be careful and make sure that it didn't get lost in low lighting, Oyster was perfect. So, because the paper is quite reflective and it, it does have um, quite a white base to it. It's a 
kind of a semi-gloss, you know, uh, for, for want of a better word, satiny kind of finish. It is a kind of, uh, you know, somewhere between satin and a flat gloss. So it's a really, really nice paper. It's not overly reflective. So if you're worried about, you know, not wanting to have too many reflections on a print, it's really good for that. The other thing about it is, if you're giving a print to somebody, okay, and they, they're the kind of person that maybe you think would prefer a photographic finish as opposed to maybe a matte finish, Oyster is perfect, you know, for situations like that. Unless you want, a, you know, a really archival high-end fine art paper, that's a different thing entirely, but it's perfect for general purpose printing where you want a really kind of true traditional photographic finish. Okay? Okay, so the next paper I want to briefly talk about is also in the digital photo range and that is Smooth Pearl. Okay? Now, it feels in terms of weight, it's around 280 grams, 280 GSM, okay? A little bit heavier than Oyster, but it doesn't feel it. In fact, it feels a little one of the first things I noticed about it was that it feels a little bit limper than Oyster and a little more um, flexible, okay? Less rigid than Oyster. That could be completely and utterly subjective. I'm not sure how, um, you know, that would stand up under scientific scrutiny, but this is how it feels to me, okay? The other thing about it is, it's got, it's described by Permajet as having a pearl finish. Now, what does that mean? It's Kind of a gloss, but it's not a hyper glassy sebachrome kind of gloss, okay? It's a lovely, smooth sheen finish, reminiscent of, to me, you know, old lacquers that you'd see on musical instruments and stuff like that. It's, it's more glossy than, say, a satin, but it's not a super glossy paper by any means. The other thing I really, really like about this paper is that it's got a slightly warm base. All right, so it has a different finish, a different look um, in the highlights to say, for example, Oyster. Oyster is a coolish white, okay, and in daylight it can, it can go quite, quite cold. Um, but Smooth Pearl is definitely a warmer paper. It's got a more natural white to it. So as you move, one of the things I've noticed over the years is the way different papers and different surfaces and different white coatings on papers will behave in different light sources. If you're taking your prints, say for example, in a room where they're being displayed and it's say tungsten, quite a yellow light, and then you're taking it to daylight and then maybe to fluorescent light. One of the things I have noticed about the very white papers is that not all the colors, you know, shift the same way. So when you move your print into different light environments and people view them under different types of lighting, the lighting color temperature changes, okay? The very white papers, okay, seem to change in the highlights under daylight more than they do in the rest of the color range, okay? I know that sounds a little counterintuitive, but there's a little, uh, there's a bit of a reason behind it in the way that the chemicals in the ultra white and papers with the, some of them have optical brighteners, etc. The, you know, the way they phosphoresce under daylight, similar to how on, you know, detergent advertising, you'd see the white shirt on the, the clothesline going blue in daylight. Not everything is going that blue in the scene, but the chemicals in the washing powder go slightly blue, okay, because they phosphoresce under, under daylight with, when UV light hits them. The there's a similar effect, not as dramatic, but there is a similar effect on white papers. So where white, very, very white papers are great when you need to make sure that every inch of detail uh, in amongst some of your shadows shows through because the paper is quite reflective and, and will, will, you know, avoid some of your subtle details going missing. In very bright daylight, if you've got very subtle highlight transitions, you can lose some of the highlight detail when they're viewed that way. And also your highlights can go shift to the blue a little more than your midtones and shadows can, okay? So for that reason, over the years, I've gravitated to a more natural, warmer uh, selection of papers. I still use Oyster, don't get me wrong. Whenever it's going to be viewed indoors and indoors only, 
I have no problem with printing something on something on Oyster. But when it comes to you know a print of a similar standard that I think might end up being viewed under daylight balance light, I'll go for a smooth pearl. Okay, I think it's a gorgeous paper. It has a lovely when it's printed as well. It has it is very smooth, but it's got a lovely almost. You know, it's got the feel of like a PVC jacket or something like this, okay? It's got that lovely smooth kind of varnishy kind of sheen to it, which is, which is really, really gorgeous. And it's quite flat as well. You don't see a layer on top of the ink. It's, it's, it's really, really beautiful. Um, so you have to try it to see. But again, in the digital photo range, those are my two favorite papers, okay? I just want to make a quick mention about contrast. Sometimes people think that to get the most contrast and the most range of tones they can get to, to make the most out of the tonality in their image and the contrast range, sometimes people think that they need to print on the whitest paper to do that. That's not true um, because, to give you an example, the last two papers in, that I just talked about, Oyster and um, Smooth Pearl, the contrast range on Smooth Pearl is incredible. I wouldn't think it's as bright as Oyster, um, but the range of tones that it can capture from its brightest point, okay, which is the height of paper, whatever the height of that paper is, right down until it goes completely black, the range of tones is huge. Okay, so that's what people often refer to as the D-max of a paper of a, or of a media. It's the you know, the maximum density, it comes from darkroom discussions and negative terminology, you know, when talking about negatives, the density of a negative, etc. back in darkroom days. But the D-max of that paper is really high. So the range of tones you can get from paper white down to pure black is huge, okay? And that's more important for being able to capture contrast in your print than the weight of the paper on its own. So that's something to bear in mind. Cool. The next thing, the next range of papers we're going to talk about, and these are the fiber-based papers, okay? What I've got here is a box of gold silk. For anybody who's handled papers in this range, the first thing you will notice is that you're now getting into papers that are heavier than, for example, the Oyster and Smooth Pearl. These are all over the 300 GSM type of weight, okay? So, well, the ones I'm, I'm looking at anyway. Fiber-based gold silk is this one here, for example, and that's 315 GSM. Now, at the moment, my absolute favorite fiber-based paper, um, or what people often call the Baraita papers or Baraita style papers. Incidentally, that's what the fiber-based range in Permajet's paper categorization refers to. It refers to papers that would be either Baraita style or would be true Baraita papers. All those type of papers fall under the fiber-based range, okay? They are very, very similar. You know, they are a reproduction of the type of papers that would have, you know, we would have used in the darkroom for printing really high quality reproductions. Um, they've got a really good finish, reminiscent of the sailor, silver, sailor, <laughs> reminiscent of the silver halide printing um, from darkroom days. So it really has the look and feel of a traditional photographic print. Now, Fiber-based gold silk is a very smooth version, okay? There are two other papers I really like in this range as well. Distinction, fiber-based distinction, and fiber-based royal, okay? Even though the gloss is different on them as well, and there are slightly different white bases, I, I find fiber-based gold silk, the name, you know, the, the clue is in the name, silk, it's a smoother finish, whereas distinction can be slightly more resiny, you know, to my eye. Um, which is similar to like a gypsum mineral, gypsum mineral type of type of resinous kind of um, fibrous finish to it. Now, you have to see it to see what I mean. It probably sounds like there's a texture. There's not. These are not textured papers. But 
you know, every paper has some kind of a feel and a look to it. And that's the slight variation between those. Now, I find gold silk to be a very natural looking paper. It's got a very natural, again, slightly warm white base to it, okay? And you can see that as we go through, I am drawn to the warmer papers these days. I find that they're the ones that keep the most consistent look and feel to most images between different light sources. There are reasons why, you know, depending on what you're printing, a certain image might not work on a warmer paper. We'll talk about that in a while. But for me, my fiber-based paper of choice for monochrome and color at the moment is gold silk. I absolutely love it. I'm experimenting and I've been printing recently with fiber-based pearl. It's a slightly more pearlescent type of slightly more varnishy type finish um, than fiber-based gold silk. Similar in some ways to the look of, for example, the finish on smooth pearl, but it's a, just a far heavier, far higher quality paper um, and far more reminiscent of darkroom Barita paper. Okay? Now, of the three fiber-based papers that I print most, have printed most um, on, the Gold Silk, Distinction, and Royal. Gold Silk, I would have no hesitation printing both monochrome and color on. I would print almost any type of image on it. Again, because of the tactile nature of, you know, human beings and how we assess things by feeling them and seeing them up close, you know, things that would have had, you know, that we would traditionally have associated with traditional photographic processes, like, you know, traditional portraiture, um, traditional general contrast range scenes, things like that. Even though those images work on many different types of paper, to the general Joe Soap out there, if you're presenting them with a print, maybe a client or something, some of these people often associate those type of images with the photographic style paper. And even though they might work on many other papers, sometimes, for that reason, the best choice is to put them on a fiber-based paper like this. Now, I have no hesitation printing monochrome and color images on um, fiber-based gold silk because the color balance, I just love the color tone on it. And even though there is no paper out there in the world that is 100% high fidelity to, you know, your image in your file, okay? Because the ink profile is correct for all the ink going on. It, it'll correct for the, the paper base to a degree, but there's different amounts of paper showing at the areas where there's heaviest ink on the paper and less ink on the paper, okay? So the paper will always have an impact, all right? But for me, if I'm printing on a very photographic looking paper and I want a high quality fine art reproduction, gold silk is what I would use first choice these days for monochrome or color. Distinction is, is slightly cooler, so I don't love it on monochrome images as much as I, for example, you know, I do like it on a lot of color images. It's got that very dark room kind of look and feel to it as well. So if I'm doing, you know, printing headshots for somebody, for example, for an artist or a musician or whatever, and they want a photographic look to their, to their headshots or an, art, an actor even, it's a fantastic paper to put them on, okay? I would lean towards color ones rather than monochrome images with, with distinction. Now, we're beginning to get into territory of, you can hear him describing how people are viewing the images as well, okay? If you're giving headshots to a, an actor, in print, or if you're, you know, printing stuff for, you know, again, a musician or anybody who's going to have stuff, you know, that people are going to view at close range, you'll see that those are the types of images I'm mentioning a lot on this type of paper, okay? For very good reason, because the biggest factor that I use when I decide what paper I'm going to print an image on, okay? is always where is the image going to be viewed, okay? Because in any of the categories we've, we're looking at, digital photo, the fiber-based papers, and the fine art ranges, in any of those categories, you will find a paper that will work for any image, okay? So one of the habits people get into early is the fact that they think to themselves, okay, 
I want to get into printing and printing very contrasty images. I think it needs to be on these traditional fiber based papers with a very high D-Max so I can get really rich blacks, etc, etc. And you know, the kind of either semi-gloss or gloss kind of finish on the paper will accentuate the contrast and that's what I need. Or they're saying, these are very commercial style images. They're like travel posters. They're like brochure images and I want to showcase them the best. So I'm going to put them on a super glossy paper. Okay. And then they hang them in a gallery where they have no control over the lighting maybe. And as people are walking around the room, looking at them, they're getting a lot of reflections. So that's an example of how I make, you know, my decision um, about what papers to print on, okay? It's more important to ask yourself where are the images going to be viewed than what type of image goes on what paper, okay? Because then you can still ask that question second, but the first question should always be where are they going to be viewed? So for close-up stuff, very intimate type uh, picture presentation, like I said, in people's portfolios, for their headshots as actors or, or whatever, or for your own portfolio. Semi-gloss and satin and silk and gloss papers, they're fantastic for that. Because, you know, very few people don't like the look and feel of traditional photographic surfaces. Okay? So, let's move on to the fine art range. Okay, so now we move into the fine art range. Just a quick word on what that means, okay? That causes a lot of confusion. A lot of people, you know, when they see that there are papers categorized as fine art papers and other papers categorized as photo papers, etc., etc., they get confused about what that really means. And people, you know, often think, oh, this is fine art because it looks painterly, so that means it must be printed on a fine art paper or it's not fine art. Fine art can be on anything, okay? Anything you do that, you know, for various creative reasons or whatever falls under the category of fine art and it doesn't even have to be a certain type of image or certain types of, of photography. Fine art can cover anything depending on, you know, what it's for, what the message is in it, how creative it is, and creative doesn't mean necessarily, you know, Photoshop or anything. I mean creative in the sense of, you know, you as a creative person are creating images purely for self-expression, okay? It can all be fine art, all right? And um, that's why you see under the banner of fine art, you will see all types of images in exhibitions and galleries in the academic fine art world, etc. Okay, so people often get this kind of confusion that fine art means it must be kind of, uh, you know, have a certain look and be on certain types of paper. That's, that's not true. The reason these papers are categorized as fine art papers is because they're reminiscent of the materials used by painters and artists in the past. Okay, so take this one for example. This is photo art silk, all right? This is a heavy-ish paper as well. It's about 290 GSM, I think. To my eye, it's quite a natural white paper as well, but all of these papers, now this is one of the smooth fine art papers, okay? So we're gonna talk about the smooth ones first and then we'll briefly touch on one or two textured. They're kind of reminiscent of the cartridge paper that you would have seen in sketch pads if you bought sketch pads or bought sheets of sketching paper, um, you know, for use with pencils or maybe even charcoal over the years, and you can still get them. Go into a stationery shop and look at normal sketch pads, not watercolor pads now, just normal sketch pads. And you'll see the cartridge paper in those um, has a certain look and feel to it. A lot of these papers, when you, you know, the fine art papers, when you pick them up and look at them, they're reminiscent of that. Except obviously, they've got very specialized coatings for receiving inkjet ink and to give a specific look. This one, photo art silk, has, you know, quite a smooth cartridge paper look to it, okay? This is difficult to show, so we would never see this in video, but, but you know, this is kind of the experience of using it. It's a very smooth look, um, and it looks for all the world like really high quality cartridge paper maybe, but then when you print on it, it takes on a kind of a slightly, they say it's got a, Permajet describes it as having a silk, satiny silk kind of layer. It, actually, what are the words they actually use? Let me double check here. So, Permajet says, 
with a unique ink receiving layer that exhibits a striking silk finish, okay? I don't disagree with that, but to me, it's even got a slightly leathery kind of look to it. You'll see little undulations in, in the flat areas on the image. So I find this paper to be really, really, really good for printing images that have a high degree of mid-tone in them, okay? Lots of flat mid-tone color. If you've got very dark areas, those little undulations and the silky look to the, to the finish can maybe break up that area a little bit and be a little distracting. But in, a, in images that have lots of mid-tone blocks of color, then it's absolutely stunning. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, paper. And to me, like I said, it's quite heavyweight. It's got quite a natural white base as well. So color, reproduction, detail, everything incredible. Okay? So that's that. Okay, the next paper I want to briefly talk about is this one here, which is, let's see, I just make some room for myself. This is Portrait Rag 285, okay? It's a slightly later version of a paper in the past called Portrait 300. Um, so some, some of you who had printed in the past might be familiar with that, but this is 285 GSM. So it's slightly later, you know, less expensive to ship <laughs> and easily managed as well. But it's a gorgeous paper. It's a kind of, a, it's a natural white to my eye. I think they describe it as a medium white paper. It's got a smooth surface. I mean, you can see if, when you hold it up against the light at a, at a very high angle, you can see the the paper texture in it. It's a 100% cotton rag based paper. So it's a really, really good choice for making fine art reproductions that you want to be archival. All of these papers that I've talked about today will take pigment and dye based ink. But again, you're printing gicle prints with pigment ink on archival paper. This kind of paper is, is a fantastic choice. It's actually one of my two all time favorite papers. Okay. This is a smooth finish paper. So, if you want high quality archival fine art prints on a smooth surface, this is my go-to paper for that type of thing. I mean, you know, printing with your pigment inks, making your gicle prints on a smooth fine art paper, this is the way to go. It's a gorgeous paper. It's a 100% cotton rag based paper. And I absolutely love it. It's a, you know, the sharpness, the color, you've got to see it to know what I mean. You'd never get that in video. You, it would never come across but I think you can hear from how I'm describing it, my enthusiasm for this paper, okay? Okay, the other smooth fine art paper I want to talk about is this, Portrait White, okay? Very well known paper for very good reason. It's an incredibly high quality paper, okay? It's got a much brighter white finish, white surface than um, Portrait Rag 285 does to my eye. Um, and I think, look, to be fair, I mean, it's, it's quite obviously brighter. If you were in person and put two of them side by side next to each other, you would see that the, the portrait rag is obviously slightly warmer, okay? Because this is a, a much whiter paper again, it doesn't have as warm a white point. So I find it works really well on images that have a lot of pale blues, upper mid-tones, things like that in them, okay? Um, you know, areas where you don't want to, if you've got very subtle high key tones and they're all slightly cool, if you use a warmer paper, some people find that the warmth of the paper can diminish the, the coolness of their highlights. It's never been a huge problem for me to be fair, but I would still stick to this paper if I'm printing anything that has a lot of light blues. So very pale seascapes and some of my in images previously from places like Santorini um, and other images from Greece where you'd have a lot of pale whites and slate blue tones, middle of the day, sea, stuff like that. I have printed them on portrait white and it can look incredible. Also, just like with Oyster, if I've got images where I want to make sure detail, you know, reflects a lot and, and, and stays obvious in areas where it could slightly get lost under certain lighting, portrait white is a good, good call for that as well because the extra little bit of white can lift some of your, your highlight details and images that are generally darker as well. Okay, so that's Portrait White. 
Okay, now the last couple of papers we're going to talk about belong to the fine art range again, but they're the textured fine art range, okay? Um, I'm going to stick to two of them, um, because they're the ones that I probably have the most experience with. I've printed on quite a lot of them, and I love them, and they're, a lot of them are good for different things. But these two give a good um, example of two different types of textured fine art paper, okay? You'll see that I'm drawn to the papers that have a natural white base, whether they're textured, whether they're smooth, whether they've got a matte or gloss or silk finish or whatever. Um, you'll find that I do tend to prefer the natural white base on the papers these days, and this is no exception. This is gallery etching, okay? It's 310 GSM, so quite a heavy, sturdy paper. If you're putting images into mounts, but you're not putting a backboard on them, this is a good sturdy paper. Um, portrait portrait uh, rag is, is, you know, similar in that regard, but it wouldn't be as stiff as gallery etching. So this is a really good example. If you're taking a lot of images around to show to maybe institutions, clubs, universities, whatever, or you're taking a lot of things around to, to, to show people to potentially sell, and you don't want the extra weight of a backboard, a good stiff fine art paper like this is your best friend on the back of a mount, okay? The other thing about it is this is quite a heavily textured paper. If you've ever seen, you know, I mentioned earlier sketch pads and cartridge paper. If you've ever seen the more textured sketch pads, not a canvassy texture now, but an undulating cartridge paper type surface that people would often use for sketching with charcoals, for example. This is that type of paper, it's that type of surface. It's quite a rich, deep texture to it. And it absolutely looks fantastic on images that, you know, you think don't have too much high frequency detail. High frequency detail would be, for example, lots of very, very small details in repeating patterns or even random patterns, but just lots of, lots of very small details. But where you've got, you know, broad areas of, of, of tone, etc., this can be a gorgeous, gorgeous paper to print it on. Okay, it's got really good color and detail reproduction again. So it's not that the texture uh, obliterates detail when you print on it or anything, not at all. It's just that obviously the texture itself is a feature. So it can obviously distract in images where you've got a very, very high texture, high detail type of, type of image going on. So um, I would use it for you know, things that would look a little bit more uh, broad brush stroke, I guess, is the term I'm looking for. Okay, I've printed some of my sleep, uh, Sleeping Beauty and Giselle images on this, and they've worked really well. They've worked really, really well. So again, this is Gallery Etching 310, gorgeous paper. The last paper I want to talk about, also in the textured fine art range, is this paper. This is Museum Heritage 310. This is my all-time favorite paper. It is an incredible surface to print on, okay? Just describing the paper first, it's a slightly off-white, very natural looking white base again. Um, to my eye, it's slightly warm. It has a slight texture, okay? It's again like the cartridge papers you would see in sketch pads, but very slight. Not as heavily textured as gallery etching, for example. But it's got a very slight texture on it that gives it that rich, you know, there's something of a depth that a slightly textured paper can add to an image. Because the texture is slight, I find it works for everything. I have yet to find an image type, high contrast, low contrast, high detail, low detail, monochrome, color. I have yet to find an image type that does not work on this paper. It's an incredible paper. It's, um, the colors are amazing on it. The Permajet touted as having a really high gamut and very low color error. Look, what that translates into is it doesn't shift the colors when you print it. The colors are really good. Uh, it doesn't, you know, as it, the, your ink hits the layer, the colors don't, you know, get messed up. It doesn't have difficulty printing smooth transitions of colors, things like that. And that's how I see this paper when I print on it. So where at all possible, the vast majority of my work gets printed on this paper. There are some images that benefit from a smoother paper, and then I would print on Portrait Rag 285. There are some images, because there may be a slightly cooler image, 
that can benefit from a, a more whitened paper and those I tend to print on portrait white. Okay, like I mentioned, the bluish Santorini type images and things like that. But for the vast majority of my work, it's Museum Heritage 310. Okay, I mentioned earlier that the big deciding factor, the first question you should ask when you are looking to print images and deciding what paper to print them on, the first question you should ask is, where are they going to be displayed? And that is absolutely the case. Now, 90% of what I print is on matte paper. And these ones that I discussed today are the ones that I print on. The reason it's on matte paper is because I take them to conventions, I take them to trade shows, I take them to workshops, to lectures, to clubs, in universities. They can be taken anywhere and I have no idea what the light source is going to be. So in that scenario, if I'm taking things for public display, nine times out of 10, I would print them on a matte surface, a matte paper. There, in that situation, there is very little benefit from printing on a gloss or a satin, etc. Okay, because reflections can be distracting. The other types of printing that I then do would be for family, friends, for my own um, portfolio books, or for clients. And a lot of the time in those situations, because people get to see them up close, Reflections are less of a distraction and also a lot of people appreciate the look and feel of traditional photographic paper. In those situations, I would nine times out of 10 print on one of the fiber-based burrito papers that I discussed. Can you print on those papers for exhibition? Absolutely, absolutely. And if there are situations where people can get up close to them, even better. Okay, so I'm not saying one should be done in this situation and this is 100% correct and that's 100% wrong, not at all. There are obviously situations where you can flip back and forward between matte and gloss, but if, for me, if you're going somewhere and you have no idea what the reflections are going to be like, what the lighting is going to be like, I find the matte papers are a safer bet, and you can find a matte paper that works for any image, okay? Um, and then for up close, I really love the look and feel of the textured papers. If you're print, or of the, sorry, the, the silk and, and glossy fiber-based papers, okay? If you're, printing commercial looking stuff and you want that poster type effect a really really good option for that is something like um you know fiber-based royal gloss okay it's a really really glossy paper and it has a really good kind of postery look to it so it is really good for commercial style images while at the same time having a really good photographic feel to it so in terms of in the digital photo range then smooth pearl for example, is a really good postery type picture reminiscent of, you know, commercial posters and things like that. So if that suits the work you're doing in a fashion book, for example, perfect. I find the fiber-based papers are probably a little bit more hard-wearing and more enduring than, say, uh, Smooth Pearl, but it's marginal, okay? Now, I hope that was useful. Again, like and subscribe down below so you can see more of this type of content. And yeah, if you like this video, we might go into more detail on some individual papers in a series of videos going forward. So let me know in the comments, okay? So thank you and see you next time.